Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution, digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct-by-construction, concurrent, scalable solution our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. Right. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's Climate and Coordination Rcast. Unfortunately, Daryl is ill and he will not be joining us today, I don't think, but um, we have Steve Ball here with us, who is a friend of ours based in Seattle, a musician, uh, a person who works with Microsoft, a coordination uh, expert, possibly, I don't know, someone who definitely knows how to bring people together. Um, Steve, would you like to introduce yourself and say perhaps how you, how you know any of us or anything like that? Sure. Thanks, uh, Nora. Great to see you and hear you all. Uh, my name is Steve Ball, and I am a multi-decade uh, Microsoft uh, employee. I met Greg Meredith at Microsoft um, in the late 90s. I think Greg was working in Craig Mundy's world at the time, and um, I think I was in somewhere in Windows at the time. And uh, I've always been an engineer and a designer and a musician working to bring groups of people together to do semi-impossible tasks. Uh, some of that's happened at Microsoft. Uh, some of it happens in my music career as well. And Nora and I met probably six or seven years ago um, because we were in LA for a ridiculous project uh, involving a guitar orchestra of about 27 guitarists who came together for a festival and uh, Nora appeared one day and did some improvising with this large group of guitarists. And we've been collaborating ever since in a separate project that Greg, Nora, and I also work on, mostly involving improvised music or large groups of musicians who come together to do unpredictable, extraordinary acts of risky uh, music creation. How was that, Nora? That was absolutely fantastic. So today is a special day. Today is Arbor Day. Last week was Earth Day. So we're having two Fridays in a row that are commemorated for climate related, Earth related causes, which I think is great. And um, so Arbor Day, I wanted to just say a little bit about this holiday. Um, because it is today. The first Arbor Day occurred on April 10th, 1872 in Nebraska City, Nebraska. It's estimated that nearly 1 million trees were planted on that day. Um, it was founded by a tree lover called Julius Sterling Morton. Um, and by 1885, it says Arbor Day had become a legal holiday in Nebraska. The date was changed to April 22nd because that was his birthday. Um, so I guess they just made it on his birthday. So this is the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day since it started in 1872, which is very exciting. Um, so basically, it's a holiday that is used to, I guess, plant trees also to celebrate the miracle of life, I feel. Um, and um, so around the world, there are lots of celebrations taking place. Um, there's lots of ways to get involved. You can even just go to arborday.org they have a beautiful website with lots of resources ways to donate i personally have always enjoyed donating to trees for jane which is jane goodall's tree planting um, foundation also there is the world land trust which david attenborough has endorsed the world land trust does fantastic work and if anybody wants to donate you can do that or maybe you can clear your calendar uh, get a shovel and go out and plant a tree 
<laughs> somewhere around you this weekend. Um, but as we know, things are not totally rosy in the world right now, especially with respect to climate. Um, although I guess, uh, so I have a few articles I can share today and I would love to get everybody's thoughts on these articles. But I guess one thing that makes me a little kind of optimistic and uh, I think was sort of missing from the discussion about Elon Musk buying Twitter is that for the first time, I think possibly we have um, uh, a CEO of a major social media company that's also a green energy entrepreneur and a very successful one, which to me uh, sort of gives me a little bit of hope. I mean, obviously Elon really understands climate he cares about climate. He wants the future to be optimistic, something we, he said in a recent interview, he doesn't want the future to be a place where we're just solving the next problem and solving the next problem. He actually wants it to be a time and a place that we wake up and we're excited to live. We're excited to get up in the morning. We feel happy. We feel energy. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the green energy transition that he is helping perhaps um, more than almost any other single person right now, I think you could argue, at least in terms of technology. So I'm wondering what you guys think about um, that angle. Do you feel optimistic about um, Elon owning, owning Twitter for that reason? Or um, what are your thoughts on that before we get into the news? Well, I, I'm pretty excited that we get to call all the Twitter users uh, either musketeers or muskrats, but... Um... I have a feeling that Elon is going to have to stumble around and make a lot of uh, mistakes because this is not really his area of expertise. So, I'm plus one on that, Greg. I believe that there's always, uh, you know, a set of pros and cons on any major leadership change, uh, it, whether it's the government or something like you know, Elon taking over. Twitter, there's some long list of amazing accomplishments that, you know, Elon Musk has uh, done over the years. And even within that list, I'm sure there's an equally balanced, it might even be some third law of thermodynamics at work where there's some equal and opposing list of pros and cons. In the uh, aspect of taking over Twitter, I agree, he might not have expertise, but I do think there is underneath most of his actions some rational science driven understanding and it does give me hope when people who have training in science and some kind of rational um occasional rational behaviors that are driven from science it gives me hope that we may have more hope to for example reach carbon neutrality someday or at least have some awareness of the impact that we have in our uh how the math in our local environment affects math globally. So I'm generally hopeful. I think there's a lot of additional uh, things going on and then maybe potentially negative side of this process. Um, but it's, gen it's interesting to see that it is generating heat and conversation and debate. And that itself feels like it is a worthwhile um, uh, piece of energy unfolding to watch. Steve, yeah. any quick thoughts? Oh, yes, Steve. Steve, too. Oh, maybe yeah. Steve, one, and you're <laughs> Steve, too. Okay, well, whatever. Yeah, well, it, it certainly brings, um, you know, with, with, with all that uh, Elon has done, it's going to bring more awareness to, to the, the, the Green Initiative. So that in itself, you know, is, is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously watching him on SNL, I think it was this past year, he's a bit socially awkward so it's like okay and now he's running twitter okay that's fine um yeah. <laughs> but i just thought it was interesting i hadn't thought about i mean i've heard, you know i've been reading a lot about this whole thing and obviously everyone's talking about it and there's lots more to discuss in the world that is more important than oh look elon bought now but i just it gives me a little hope that he's very aggressive on climate and now he owns twitter so or at least he almost owns Twitter. I guess it still needs to go through, but yeah. Um, okay, well, good. So I wanted to share a few headlines that, are, that have come out this past week about climate because some weeks are kind of less voluminous and 
the headlines are, as I've been doing hosting, co-hosting, I guess, this conversation for quite a long time, um, some of the headlines can be quite nebulous and sort of weird, but this week they were quite strong and um, there was a lot of sort of front page type climate news and obviously none of it is very rosy because right now um, (laughs) we're not in a very optimal place um, in this fight, but um, I think we can get there. I am optimistic, generally. Um, but I just wanted to point this out because I think there's a couple headlines that are very important to bear witness to. Um, and I think it's also really interesting that these headlines are becoming, I think, especially in the last six months to the last year, even, they're becoming very stark, very clear, and like they're not as measured as they used to be. And I think that's actually kind of a good thing. Like instead of, for example, five years ago, you'd see a headline that said, climate creates widespread changes. And um, like, it's like, oh, is that good? Is it bad? It doesn't, you know, obviously you need to do more than just read the headline, but um, a lot of the reporting on climate was happening, but it wasn't very clear um, what, they were really trying to say it was just kind of saying change is coming a lot of uncertainty widespread this confusion an increase of that wasn't very strongly put but this headline from usa today is incredibly strong um this is from yesterday and it says climate change could cause mass extinction of marine life in earth's oceans So I guess I don't know where the marine life is if it's not in Earth's oceans, but I guess they're specifically saying in the ocean rather than the rivers, maybe in other places. Um, But yeah, so I think this is a great piece here. It's short. Um, It's in USA Today, so hopefully lots of people will see it. But they're basically now starting to report in a headline fashion about the risk of mass extinction, which I think is really good. They, in the third bullet point in the top, they say it can be the the next 100 to 300 years, (laughs) which I think is kind of funny. I mean, we're already seeing mass extinction all over the place, so it's not going to be 300 years away. Um, It's going to be, you know, soon. Um, But um, yeah, this piece just sort of outlines why that's happening. It explains that the main factor is the heat, rising heat in the oceans. Um, obviously everybody knows that most of the planet is water. And so a lot of heat is absorbed by the ocean. Um, that is actually making life for us humans on land much easier, but at the expense of the life in the ocean. Um, so, um, obviously we don't know if the extinction is going to continue for the next hundred to 300 years. I think there's a possibility that we could stop that from happening, But this is sort of the first time that I've seen a mass extinction being reported in a major newspaper as a possibility in a headline. Um, So I hope that it um, kind of just makes people think about this in uh, a more concrete way. Um, Have you guys seen any headlines like this in the past few years? I think there, it feels to me like there are waves of news about potential mass extinction, not all related to, of course, um, climate change. I remember, I don't know if it was when I was in college or there was some period of time a while ago when there was a whole wave of nuclear fear. And there was a movie called The Day After, which was sort of the story of some sort of nuclear incident that wiped out the planet. And uh, I think I was young enough at the time to not really understand what the implications were, but I do feel like there are waves of awareness that sort of ripple through society or ripple through our species um, that cause some attention to be engaged for a little while. Um, and if you look at the other news headlines recently, there's also the news flying around about the war in Ukraine and the potential for nuclear escalation there. In a way, I feel like those kinds of headlines um, sometimes overwhelm the more subtle um, stories about, you know, what's required to get to carbon neutral or, you know, to get to, um, what is the phrase, carbon removal. Um, 
and some of the um, stories around like th this USA Today observation feel like they're beginning to enter the territory that used to be observed or, or discussed about sort of just nuclear holocaust. Um, and in a way that's good for raising attention. I'm not sure if the hype that comes with that though leads to actions that actually practically help. Um, I think maybe calling attention is useful um, and maybe raising awareness is useful, especially in a place like USA Today. But I wonder what the trickle down effects are. That's something, I don't know if there's math to um, track that kind of cause and effect. Um, it reminds me of something I saw fly by today about the idea that promotion or album reviews don't actually impact sales of, album, of music at all, um, good or bad, negative or positive. There may be some other energy underneath the wave of the activities going on that aren't necessarily impacted about whether there's news about them or not. So I, I want to maybe raise that as a interesting observation about whether the news has any impact at all on the actual energy being invested to solve these problems. Thoughts? Uh, well, I, I mean, I guess I'm very of 100 to 300 years because uh, that, that gives people the, the excuse to kind of check out and go, oh, oh well, that's, that's not my life. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, whereas if we blow past, uh, what is it, 1.5 degrees, the Great Barrier Reef is gone. I got the I facts right. I think it's right. two degrees is the cutoff for the reef, but yeah, 1.5 okay. is sort of the um, is sort of the spot where we think humanity is going to really, for sure, be okay if it's 1.5 and under. After it's 1.5, it starts to become, who knows? Oof. Yeah. If we if we stay under 1.5, it's okay. But once we blow past it, things go really wrong. Um, yeah, so, so okay, two, at, at two degrees, but, but two degrees is on the 25 to 35 year horizon, uh, unless we really change our behavior. So we're going to see mass extinction, you know, when my uh, mass uh, marine life extinction, when my kids are in their prime. Um, so I, it makes me sad if they're going to blast these headlines and then not follow up with and we need to start working right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's lots to worry about that's already happened and that's already happening. That maybe is more useful to point out to people than just, you know, like the worst, the headline that expresses the worst potential outcome far in the future, rather yeah. than the nuanced, subtle, like current situation which yeah. is something we can actually do now because all that they're like my friend was my friend just posted what do you think is the best day of the week to discover new music and i said i think it's today because that's the only day i've ever had is today so <laughs> um, <laughs> today is the best day to discover anything um <laughs> yeah. yeah you're hard pressed to discover anything outside of today <laughs> yeah. um but yeah, no, I totally agree with you, Steve. Um, yeah, there is definitely a lot of alarmism and doomsday stuff, which I think, you know, it's such, it's such a tricky um, line to walk because you mm -hmm. want to be aware. You want to make people realize like, hey, nature is not a given in our lifetime. We yeah. think it's going to be there for sure, but like, we don't know. I don't know if when I'm 50 years old, if there will be giraffes or, you know, anything polar bears, like, I don't know. I hope so. I really yeah. hope so, but I don't know for sure. And so like, you want to be aware of what's happening. You want to try to make good conscientious choices, but also you don't want to make people like so depressed that they just check out and don't even want to, you know, basically engage with the world or possibly even live anymore, yeah. which is why I think what Elon said, love him or hate him, or maybe a bit of both for most people. Yeah. Um, I think it's really powerful that he has this vision for the future that's actually about optimism and actually yeah. about wanting to believe that the future is going to be good and working to make it good rather yeah. than just saying, oh, crap, uh, you know, there's an extinction on the horizon or a nuclear threat or 
Yeah. You know, whatever it is going to be. It also does feel like, at least in the area of climate change, we each, each individual has somehow a little more um, active power in influencing what's going on, even though it might feel microscopic or nanoscopic or uh, super small. But one of the other reasons that I feel hopeful is I, I know my own company where I've worked for a couple of decades, Microsoft has made some amazing commitment to try to get to carbon neutrality. I think it's within the next eight years. And then I think a couple of decades beyond that, they want to essentially um, erase all of the uh, carbon footprint that they've created since uh, whatever they were founded in the 70s. And so in a way, seeing large organizations take on an explicit goal um, also feels hopeful in that there might be some additional trickle down peer pressure that could help other large organizations who have power to have um, tangible measurable impact in a way that some individual action of riding a bike instead of driving or um, planting a tree uh, instead of uh, you know taking a flight um, may uh, have some longer term impact by it reminds me almost of the pledge to give away for for very wealthy people to give away all of their income I feel like that also had a trickle down effect of when one person decided to pledge their wealth to uh, charity, it also seemed to have some kind of trickle down peer pressure impact. And I'm hoping that large organizations can take on a collective point of view on this and have more of a multiplying effect on the goals for what Greg described, um, uh, ha having more tangible impact in the short term versus trying to somehow motivate you know a few billion people to change subtle small behaviors but uh the hope doesn't necessarily replace the also sense of fear and dread uh, um i don't know greg do you have thoughts on even the or steve i'd love to hear if there are any other um patterns that describe what happens when large organizations move into action that impact and maybe even influence um, other big patterns in other fields. Or maybe it's up to, maybe it really is up to individuals in finding ways to motivate billions of individual behavior changes. Well, I, def I definitely think uh, institutional behavior counts for a lot. You know, like when, when there is institutional behavior, then um, that I think that influences people's decisions. Uh, John Doerr's book, Speed and Scale, um, is, uh, is, is speaks in a very hopeful tone about uh, you know the large corporations. So Google's plan, Amazon's plan, Microsoft's plan, all of those are extremely uh, ambitious and hopeful. Even Walmart's plan, uh, hmm. uh, you know, is very ambitious and hopeful. And I think the I would love to see those plans make headlines. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it would be fantastic if, if uh, you know, the scope and scale of Microsoft's plan or the scope and scale of Google's plan with respect to uh, uh, climate change were more widely known. Because I think a lot of people, uh, at least in the U.S., are still very much on the climate denier side of this. Yeah, um, and uh, and and even for those who are kind of uh, you know, doom scrollers or, or, or uh, doomers, I think we need to, they, they need to see that there's a big chunk of uh, the U.S. institutions that are, um, uh, you know, they're not, they're not uh, falling prey to gloom and doom and in fact are, are taking uh, specific and significant steps. Yeah. Yeah, and I also think that like, that the sort of like myth of personal responsibility is sort of constructed by a lot of fossil fuel companies and um, other forces that seem to really love when people feel totally responsible for what's going on because, because they go to Starbucks or because they don't drive 
um, you know, an EV or whatever it is. And, um, you know, obviously it's true that like individual choices help create demand for certain products um, and all that stuff. But like, I also think it's kind of a myth. Like we know that the vast majority, like over 70% of emissions are caused by about a hundred different corporations. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of stuff that's like far outside of the control um, of most regular people aside from just voting, I guess, like for example, the military industrial complex, um, which is like, you can vote for whoever you want, but like America is not letting go of that. I don't think anytime soon. so especially with this, you know, war in Ukraine, like, you know, weapons use is like way, way up, at least over there. Mm. So and for good reason. Um, but I don't think that like it's all about individual responsibility. I think it's and also it's it's more than just like I think it's so great that these certain companies have plans and Amazon is, you know, giving billions of dollars for green tech and all that like there. But there also is the biodiversity issue and i think that that's another way aside from the sort of individual's responsibility thing there's there's another way that i think people are being distracted which is that oh like green entrepreneurship is going to solve everything but that's only part of the equation because we have that's a temperature issue it's a it's an emissions issue but that's not the whole thing like if we stabilize the temperature on earth and stop actual warming, but we don't address our use of land and the extinctions that we're causing, we're going to be in deep trouble for a different reason. Like if we, if we stabilize the temperature, but we don't solve the problem of soil or the problem of fresh water. So I just feel like, you know, it's, it's great for companies to say, Oh, like, you know, we're going to have solar panels now so yeah. everybody can chill out or, you know, we're going to have Teslas so everybody can chill out. It's like, we also have to address consumption. We also have to address the ballooning demands on our resources that is basically spearheaded by American consumerism. Um, and obviously there's... a. Um, a role for government to play in this because of course governments basically outline what we are allowed to choose basically more or less they decide what our choices are and so here's a great example of something that i think is very positive um in the chat this is from politico it's um excuse me 100 european cities committing to go um climate neutral by 2030 now of course neutral basically means that the emissions that you release have been offset what we need to do to avoid mass like you know system collapse is to actually go carbon negative and to like reforest and expand you know protected areas for nature not just say okay we offset our emissions so now we're all good we have to actually get to an emissions negative place but there's lots of people working on how that can be possible, but there's a whole list of cities here. Um, it says here, it's Sofia, Rome, Budapest, and Paris, but lots and lots of others um, that are going to work on doing this. And 2030 might sound kind of far away, but it's only like seven and a half years away. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely cool. right. The, 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 the public sector is another form of, of institutional uh, organization. Uh, that, that that also individuals have direct control over, at least in democratic countries. One of the things my son pointed out to me uh, almost a year ago is that they, you know, I think a lot of the media tries to paint this picture that it's all up to the consumer. Uh, and while there is a role for the consumer, it, it, it isn't the case. Uh, so for example, the probably the largest polluter of all is the US Army. And, and, and we have a say as, as voters, we have a say over how the Pentagon behaves. And you know, a very simple policy decision would, would be all, all uh, US government vehicles, including all military vehicles are EVs by a certain time. And you, know, you could kind of phase it in so that the, you know, it works. The, the non-combat vehicles uh, you know, come first and then the combat vehicles come a decade later. Uh, but I think all of that could be uh, 
all of that could be approached. Uh, I know, for example, one of my colleagues is also working on a, a hydrogen uh, jet fuel uh, solution uh, mm -hmm. that, that is, uh, uh, could potentially be deployed, not just for commercial, but also for the military. Uh, so, so absolutely, the public sector is another place where you have uh, institutional involvement that, uh, uh, you know, and it, and it, th that can make a difference and for people to know about this, I think becomes important. And then it's not just at the top level, right? In the US, it's not just at the federal level. You know, it'd be great if uh, Seattle would join these European cities in, uh, in uh, making a commitment to to uh, carbon neutrality or carbon carbon negative uh, uh, position. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up but because here's this hilarious story. I, I caught wind of this on Twitter, but this is, this is starting to happen as of yesterday. 16 states, DC and environmental groups are suing the USPS, the Postal Service, over gas powered trucks. So apparently they were supposed to like do this big investment um, of exactly what you were saying to have electric vehicles. Um, but they're suing the Postal Service to try to stop them from purchasing like 90% of their, um, like, I guess, newer fleet is going to be gas powered and only 10% is going to be battery or electric. Um, and um, there were objections about this from the White House and the EPA. But of course, Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, who's been in the headlines a lot, um, he said that they don't have the funding to increase the number of electric vehicles that they have in, in, the, in the fleet of um, mail delivery vehicles. Um, so apparently they're getting sued now about this, which is very interesting. I'm so curious. Um, it says here, um, once this purchase goes through, we'll be stuck with more than 100,000 new gas guzzling vehicles on neighborhood streets, serving homes across our state and across the country for the next 30 years. Um, so they've kind of messed this up. And um, <laughs> I'm hoping that they will be able to reverse this or I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I just saw there was a big fight about this on Twitter. I'll put this into the chat. Um, I don't know if suing anybody is necessarily going to help, but there's definitely um, a fight about it, which, and people are, well, we're talking about it. So there you go. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important. And, you know, you can imagine also the, the local impact, right? All the kids who see the electric mail truck pull up every day to their mailbox, right? That, that has an impact. Yeah. There's also something empowering about having a kind of deadline and i think a lot of i think microsoft is uh centered on 2030 to get to carbon neutral and then begin another 20-year push to get to negative and i think it reminds me of like y2k there was this frenzy around you know making sure that we fixed all of the bad rounding um for having small bit width uh computers um that were all centered around this specific deadline and it does feel like 2030, I don't know if there needs to be a new Prince song um, to help us get through the transition to 2030, but I do think rallying around a, uh, like a singular date to try and get to neutral, whether it's from postal vehicles, Microsoft has a similar, um, I think there's a commitment to go all electric in terms of uh, vehicles and transportation. I, and I remember there's like at least seven or eight or nine principles about how Microsoft's investing across multiple domains and in multiple areas to um, bring down the overall total. So it's not just one tactical thing. Um, I think your point, Greg, about around cities, it'd be awesome to even, and I hope somebody's doing this, maybe the John Doerr book covers some of this, uh, but it'd be interesting to study what are the social groups, constructs, um, motivators of some of the larger, more institutional organizations where we could have more impact by aligning on like a carbon neutral date across industries across organizations um, and then one tactical loss of like a crazy postal um, you know scenario with a bunch of other uh, kind of weird and political motivations underneath whatever the actions are going on there won't necessarily be able to undermine a tidal wave of institutional targeted goals of hitting 2030 and getting to carbon neutral. Um, one thing I don't know, nor maybe you have this in the um, front of your uh, mind, but getting to carbon neutral 
is like even by 2030 seems like a, a great first step but what is it that keeps us from hitting that 1.5 degree threshold it, getting to neutral doesn't just do right it. so yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's it's done really and complicated it, yeah. um there's a lot of forces at play right now we've heated to about 1.2 degrees so basically we've got about one or sorry 0 0.3 to go um until we hit that limit and, and greg and lots of other people uh smart very smart people really think that 1.5 is completely lost i don't think so but i think it's extremely unlikely mm -hmm. um i think we're it's going to be much higher um but but we don't know that for sure um mm -hmm. and um like the the new IPCC report that just came out a couple weeks ago, you can look it up. Uh, the, it's IPCC.org, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they have a bunch of different versions of reports, longer and shorter ones for different people. The report mm -hmm. for policymakers is generally the, the shorter one. Um, basically, they've said that like if we don't reach peak emissions within two to three years, like by 2025, which is in two and a half years, yeah. um, we are really not in a good place so like obviously the first thing is like we're not we're not getting rid of the fossil fuel infrastructure fast enough that's mm. one thing like it was so surprising to me to hear i guess it's it's been this long but just didn't realize it that elon musk founded well i guess he first invested in tesla which was not a functioning company at the time but mm -hmm. he is apparently not the original founder anyway in yep. 2003 he was like, okay, somebody needs to accelerate this transition. And it was, it's 20 years ago, basically in six months, it's 20 years ago. Yeah. And it surprised me. Like he realized even way back then that the, the transition need to be, needed to be accelerated. But anyway, so I think one big problem is like the fossil fuel spigot is still running. Putin gets something like a billion euros a day um, for money for oil and gas still mostly from Europe right now. Um, like we have not figured out and like the fossil fuel industry wants everybody to think that they are the heroes. They've got it covered. Like, oh, we're using algae or whatever. So like everything is fine, but we haven't figured that out. We still, I don't think we've, we've changed our consumption habits enough. Mm -hmm. We haven't changed the way that we eat and like fast fashion. Like there's just so many things that we haven't, like dealt with and it like even Billie Eilish who's you know not someone that I know personally but a lot of my friends know her and have worked with her and I think she's a wonderful artist she ha she she just came out with these like sneakers from Nike I think they're Nike sneakers and apparently they're you know more sustainable materials or whatever it is but it's like it's still more consumerism she is a person that I think understands the climate crisis. She's talked about it. She's worn t-shirts that say no music on a dead planet. And yet she is selling these sneakers still. So it's like, this is the habit of everybody comes out with a makeup line. Everybody comes out with clothing lines, everybody. So it's like, we just haven't made that shift to like, no. you know, Greta Thunberg, like has said, you know, lover or hater or whatever. She said, like, you need to ask yourself, like, is there room in the carbon budget for this? And, you know, and the carbon budget is basically the the amount of carbon that we can emit in, at any time going forward and still stay below a certain um, like threshold. So, um, you know, the. <laughs> You just put a, the comet is coming think of the new jobs exactly that's why that movie don't look up was so genius is that you know of course they're not going to deflect the comet I, I love that board meeting they're all sitting around at the table and 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 then he starts to go into the spiel about the value of the rare metals the minerals yeah and you just see the scientists like faces start to melt down. Um, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I don't know if that really answers your question. There's a lot of complex stuff going on. Um, also you have a terrible situation where China is like, Oh, we don't want to do anything that is more aggressive than the, what, what the U S is doing. And the UK says that about us. Then mm -hmm. Sweden says that about the UK and then, you know, whatever. And it goes on and on and on. Yeah. 
rather than everybody saying, okay, what's the most aggressive? We can do this. And then I guess the, the elephant in the room is also that all of the interests are aligned around capitalism. Like basically you saw that in a microcosm with Twitter, like basically because somebody had the, um, the amount of money needed to, that was up and above the, the, sh the current share price, there's like a fiduciary responsibility to take the deal and to let it go through because the shareholders are enriched by that. Um, so it's like, you don't even have a mechanism. I don't think like, thank God it was Elon and not, you know, Putin that wanted to buy Twitter or something like, um, obviously he's, you know, not American and, you know, so maybe there's some guardrails in place, but it just seems like everything is for sale for the right quick price under this system and you don't really have guardrails in place in terms of you know what is the best decision for for the for people for the society for planet it's always this fiduciary responsibility um which of course if you're a shareholder which i am in in several companies it's important to have that stuff in place but how can how can these fossil fuel companies make the right decisions when they're basically bound by law to seek profit first it kind of puts a lot of people that I think are well-meaning and probably have good ideas into a very back foot position, awkward position, because maybe there isn't really a legal way to, to scale down, to, um, to draw down, to decarbonize or possibly shocker, have a year that's less profitable. Um, well, I, that's exactly what I was thinking about with respect to the, the, the uh, postal service deal is, you know, um, there is someone who would get the short end of the stick when you, uh, it, it, in other words, the, the manufacturers of the, the trucks that were bought, they'll get the short end of the stick if that uh, uh, lawsuit goes through. But another approach is, you know, those states could band together and, and just give a grant to the manufacturer if they're willing to admit to uh, to moving over to manufacturing electric vehicles, right? And 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 you know so so uh, rather than spending money on a lawsuit, they spend money directly with the manufacturer and say retract your deal, yeah. put those trucks on ice, and and commit to uh, commit to to going green, make make electric vehicles, partner with someone, do you know? You, you see, it's a the thing is that we have to begin to think in a different way. We have to think yeah. about, we're all in this together. We're all going to die <laughs> um, much sooner if we don't work together. Um, so, so that, so I, you know, I, I take your point, Nora. It's like, we have to look at this in a very different perspective now. Well, the incentives are just all off for everything in politics in the food system, I mean, it's like just we have screwed ourselves so bad on incentives that there's so many things that we should be doing that we want to be doing, and it's just so hard to get them off the ground. Um, like we, like the fossil fuel industry knew that what they were good, what they were doing, was going to cause mass suffering and death in like the '60s, um, maybe even the late '50s. So, you know, now you've got like 60 years of this denial, fraud, abuse, corruption cocktail. And like, of course, it's 2022 and we're freaking out because we have to hit peak emissions in three years or we lose the coral reefs. Like, of course, that's where we're at. I mean, it's it sucks. It's not fair. It's certainly not what I wanted to spend my time doing. Um, inconvenient since the 80s. Yes. <laughs> but um you know and i'm not like a perfect person either there are lots of things that i mean i i love flying to europe i love driving my lexus um that's not an ev although i want my next car to be an ev i like you know i'm not a perfect person either um but i think the most sad thing to me when i look at the whole system of it aside from just the wasted time and decades which is pointless to because it's over is just the, the fact that it's so hard to get incentives aligned. Um, that I think is, is, is the saddest thing for me because that's something that we can all try to work on. Like that's one way that consumers have an individual responsibility. At least we can stop putting pressure on the wrong stuff to happen. 
Mm -hmm. um, even though it's not entirely our choice. Like we are the demand side of it, at least in some respect. Yeah, I mean, uh, Steve, you're, uh, uh, I was thinking a lot about, uh, as you were talking to a lot about uh, Bill Gates's interview with, um, with uh, 60 Minutes last year about this time. Yeah. Where, you know, I mean, he, he takes head on that where it's gonna require global coordination. Exactly. Beyond, beyond what we saw with World War II. Yeah, uh, and a lot of his investments are are not just. It was speaking of incentives, Nora. A lot of his investments are all around uh, getting people to shift lifestyle. Yeah. So, except for him shorting Tesla, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Short term decision. It's all right. Yeah. Speaking of complex decisions. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Greg. In a way, we do have some leaders whose credibility also has a similar graph to the carbon emissions graphs that seem to, I think, cycle in five-year <laughs> chunks, or I, I forget what the cycle is, but I, I remember seeing a picture of the last 40 years where there's this average trend going up, but I do think there are cycles up and down that maybe, um, you know, uh, having shorter impact. I don't think it's just yearly or, or uh, you know, glo global climate relative to our position in the sun, but I do think, Gates talk in 60 Minutes described one of the ways where diversification of investment to study how do you enable behavior change? How do you enable institutional change? Where do you put the investments now to get us to better batteries, to get us to more efficient vehicles, to get us to um, institutional decision making also that has uh, more of a domino effect so that the peer pressure that we've seen in you know uh, wealthy people giving away their wealth uh, could trickle down into other places even to describe where venture capitalists put their investments in you know green initiatives and specific technology investments that may have a 20-year um, you know return cycle um, but uh, just even being able to think about the idea that our micro investments have this macro impact is new and hard, I think, for our species. Yeah, and it may be that we, even, yeah, go ahead. We know, we know all about this as musicians, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One note can change the entire key. That's One right. One note can change the entire mood, which That's is an right. interesting parallel to the other universe we live in. Yes. <laughs> well, here's something that just came across my inbox literally right now, which is so cool. Um, this is a, a, a partnership that the Ocean Cleanup, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, familiar with the Ocean Cleanup. I've donated to them and they're wonderful. The head of Ocean Cleanup is a genius guy called Boyan Slat, who is, I think, from the Netherlands. And he founded it when he was like, I don't know, 15 years old. 13, yeah, very young. I, I don't know what is going on with these people, but they're doing it. Um, the Ocean Cleanup is a cool project. Basically, he invented all these like little machines. They're like little boats. And they have these very gentle but effective ways to pick up trash in different rivers, which feed trash into the ocean. And he also has these huge systems that clean up trash. Um, his goal was to stop the Pacific garbage patch from expanding and then finally to remove it um, from the ocean. So he's basically cleaning up all these water systems. And um, the ocean cleanup has partnered with Kia, the car manufacturer. Apparently, um, they've signed a seven-year global partnership deal. Kia is going to provide funds and in-kind contributions for ocean operations and for the instruction, sorry, construction of Interceptor original which is the interceptor is their um, sort of boat like thing that goes through the rivers that intercepts trash before it goes to the ocean. And also apparently Kia is going to integrate recycled ocean plastic harvested by the ocean cleanup into Kia's value chain process. So this is exciting. So I guess they're like, hey, uh, we'll pay you to find the materials for our next car and they're floating in the river somewhere. <laughs> small, small world. I was just talking uh, yesterday or the day before with the CEO of um, Carbon Meta. So they have uh, partnered with uh, Oxford 
to develop a, um, a process whereby they take plastics and convert it into um, the components, including carbon black and you know a, a bunch of the other elemental components, and then return those back to uh, to industry to use in other ways. Um, and uh, one of the deals that they're hoping to to strike is a um, a, a deal with the uh, ocean cleanup crew to to get their pl the plastics they extract from a Pacific garbage patch and run it through their process. Uh, so it, it's it is interesting that ocean cleanup come comes to me uh, you know twice in one week, uh, but they they want to use they want to use our chain to do all the tracking. Uh, so uh, tracking the materials from. Uh, from you know when they when they take in the plastics uh, to uh, to when they they produce the raw materials that they give back to industry. That's amazing. That would be such a cool project for our chain to be involved with. And yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to be hopeful for if you look around. I just think like we're in an era now where nature is not really self sustaining and self um, perpetuating. Like we're in an era now where we need to really be more active in how like you know this guy Ed edgar mcgregor who's who's a climate activist near me he posts videos of himself cleaning up trash every day in pasadena he posts a video of the bucket of trash and like it used to be like the passive way from the last hundred years or whatever is like if you litter there's a fine okay but like who's gonna ever see you litter and like you're still allowed to litter you just have to pay a fine but now the, the active idea would be like let's pay people who are unemployed to go into the parks let's pay them 20 bucks an hour and get them to pick up trash like let's just do that and then we know for sure there'll be no trash and forget the fines because obviously they don't work so you know that shift from passive policy to active policy and what can we all, how can we all contribute to that? Like, you know, it's Arbor Day. Can we, can we make donations? Can we pick up trash wherever we are? Like, what can we all do that's more active to turn this thing around? <laughs> yeah. So I'm noticing that it's a, it's three minutes till staff meeting. Maybe, um, maybe uh, Steve Ball would like to take us out. Yeah, I want to um, maybe uh, just f focus back on the past 15 minutes of conversation and highlight the good news. Um, because I think it is really easy to, I just shared a quick Dilbert cartoon about um, Dilbert sharing his new poem with his little dog pal. Um, and the dog says, I once read that given infinite time, a thousand monkeys with typewriters would eventually write the entire works of Shakespeare. And then Dilbert says, yeah, but what about my poem? And the dog says, three monkeys, 10 minutes. And <laughs> it feels to me like some of these small initiatives that we're talking about, DeJoy and the electric vehicles post office or the garbage eating boat, um, they feel like three monkeys in 10 minutes relative to the Shakespearean task we have ahead of us of trying to figure out how to manage social infrastructure. Uh, you know, years and years of human interaction changes at a micro scale and then at looking at the multiplication on the macro scale. But I just want to say I feel encouraged and inspired by the fact that this tiny conversation, even though it might feel like a butterfly wing, is part of the momentum we need to build over time to just observe and change the way we operate. And ideally, change the momentum of how we're engaging with our institutional efforts to bring this down so that those are the areas where the biggest and most impactful multiplication can happen. So I just want to reflect on the micro and the macro and the role we have together in first raising awareness, second getting to neutral, and then third beyond neutral getting us to more than just three monkeys in 10 minutes to bring some Shakespearean change into the world. Shakespearean change. Love it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all for a wonderful discussion. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to get to talk with you. We never talk about this stuff. Yeah. We're always talking about weird, chaotic, creative things. Exactly. Which maybe preserving the planet is an, another weird, chaotic, creative thing. I think they're related. <laughs> you know, 
facing, Greg knows this, facing the, what are we going to play next? I, I don't think of these as separate, different discussions. My note can make everything dark or bright or brilliant. And so I really appreciate this collaboration in multiple domains and great to see you all here. Yay. Well, thank you all. We will be back with you again next week to bear witness to more of what happens here on our little blue marble. Thank you all for a great conversation and happy Arbor Day. Uh -huh. Happy Arbor Day. Thanks all. Thank, thank you. Guys. See you in the tree.